I was um, born there. Um, my uh, folks were both born there, so we were, I guess that makes me a second generation uh, South African. Um, and lived there, there until I was about 10 years old. Uh, so they were the, the very young years of my life. Um, and they were obviously many years ago. So my memories of those days were a bit foggy, but I do remember, and certainly in um, sort of thinking back on those years, have a vivid memory of living in a society where there were two or actually more than two classes of people. And, uh, you know, some people were uh, clearly of a lower stature and uh, didn't have the privileges that other people had. And there was, you know, extraordinarily power uh, differentials within the country. And I have, certainly thinking back on it, and I think and hope at the time, had a sense of the injustice of, uh, of the country and, and the fact that um, not everybody had the same status within the country. And uh, I think it's, you know, it shaped me as a person, it shaped my work. Um, certainly something that, uh, although I very much consider myself an American and have been a citizen since I was a teenager, um, very much uh, something that I think has shaped my background and I'm conscious of the fact that I started there. Do you think that um, that experience also affected your career path? I think it did. Um, I don't know that it affected my career path into medicine. Uh, you know, I'm a physician as well as a bioethicist. Um, and, and I don't know that it affected that part of my career path. But as I uh, got into bioethics, I think the consciousness of what people can do to each other and the way people can treat each other and the way that people can dehumanize each other, and particularly uh, people can dehumanize other people who are different than they are, has been a, a real sort of um, shaping influence in my life and how I think about my work and how I think about research. But I pretty much knew when I went to college that I would end up going to medical school. And, and at a certain point, I kind of realized that this was the time, the one time in my life, or at least in, in that part of my life, that I really had the chance to do something different, that it was possible to prepare for medical school, do what I needed to do, and at the same time, explore another interest that I had and develop another set of uh, skills that I didn't have. Uh, I, I was and continue to be the furthest possible thing from an artist. Um, couldn't draw, couldn't paint, couldn't create anything to save my life. Um, but uh, uh, but the, the, the way in which fine arts uh, packaged uh, sort of visual perception, visual attention, uh, history, because I think to understand uh, art, you really have to understand the history of the time period. Um, literary criticism of a certain type uh, and the, the ability and the opportunity to write and learn to write was something that really appealed to me. So I don't quite remember why fine arts as opposed to all of the other things that could have done that thing. It, you know, it's uh, a long time ago. Um, but it was, it was clear to me that this was something I was doing in college to develop a side of myself that I wanted to develop, um, recognizing that I was going to go on to medical school. And what led to your decision to, to um, go into pediatric oncology? So the, that was a two-step process, I guess I would say, in the sense that I first um, made the decision to go into pediatrics. In medical school, very quickly, probably by the time of my second rotation uh, as a third-year medical student, uh, pediatrics rotation, it, it grabbed me. It was the, the opportunity to work with young kids and families was something that I clearly enjoyed in a way, that it, 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 to an extent that I didn't enjoy all of the other things. Uh, that I was doing. It was just an order of magnitude different and better and, and more fun for me and, and more meaningful. So it, it didn't take long for me to decide that pediatrics was the thing. Um, once I got into my pediatrics residency, I was in San Francisco at the time, and uh, I had the, the opportunity to work with a much older uh, physician by the name of uh, Arthur Ablin, who had trained, he's a pediatric oncologist, and this was just in, in rotating through that service. Um, he had trained in the day before there was such a thing as specialty training. He had just trained as a general pediatrician. This would have been probably in the 1950s. And um, at a time when there was really no sort of curative treatment for most childhood cancers. And so his job as a primary care, as a pediatrician or a general pediatrician, uh, taking care of kids with cancer was really to, palli to palliate them, to treat their symptoms, to take care of their families. And uh, this, this man was inspirational to me. I watched him with the way he was with families, the relationships that he built with families. Um, and he inspired me to take a closer look. And, and it, it was almost uh, the, the palliative care aspects of oncology, which are prominent in a few places in pediatrics, and obviously oncology is one of them, that really uh, drew me. In fact, I thought that, I, that um, at the time that pediatric oncology would be my pathway into palliative care. 
And uh, that, that's not the way I went, but at the time it was that part of pediatric oncology that really uh, sort of pulled me in. The other thing was, um, on the one hand, it's uh, an area where one is taking care of uh, very sick children with very complicated illnesses. And on the other hand, the relationships that people, that clinicians develop with patients and families over time are pretty intense and uh, pretty longstanding. And so I, I was attracted to that combination of uh, high intensity medicine and longstanding uh, relationships. My research interests are generally in the ethics of doing research with people. And uh, pediatric oncology is a really pretty unique way to get into that. And actually probably the reason that I work in research ethics is because of my experience in pediatric oncology. So the, the, the story and the history there is pediatric oncology involves really a synthesis of research and caring for patients. And it's, it's really qu actually quite hard to tell in ways that are, I think, wonderful and create interesting challenges uh, where the one begins and the other ends. So patients are uh, sick and they're getting treatment for whatever it is that they have, but at the same time, the majority of them are involved in research, clinical trials, testing new or different ways of therapy, trying to make therapy more effective, trying to make it safer, um, trying to understand the biology of cancer, what, what led to the development of cancer, what puts people at risk for cancer, things like that. So it, it's this almost seamless blend of research uh, clinical trials and uh, taking care of patients. And so as I got into pediatric oncology and began to see that, I began to see all of the uh, both opportunities and challenges that that creates. The opportunities to really maximize the learning from every patient so that things, treatments, understanding, science, all of that can get better as quickly as possible. Um, on the other hand, the risks of um, of doing experimentation involving people in a way that sometimes it's easy to forget about because it's so much a part of what you do every day. And I think, so it was that really, that experience of connecting those two things that got me into ethics and research ethics in the first place. Um, so the things that I got interested in studying early on were some of those challenges, particularly the challenges of informed consent in a situation where the boundaries between doing research on the one hand and taking care of patients on the other are pretty fuzzy. And so a lot of my early research, and still some of my research, has to do with how we uh, seek informed consent from patients, how we seek informed consent from parents, how we engage kids at various ages and developmental stages in that uh, decision making. And my research has evolved in different ways, but I think that the starting point of it was the challenges of informed consent in a setting where research and care are happening in an intertwined way every day. The fact that um, they are kids, sometimes young kids, sometimes older kids, teenagers, um, I think is heavily influences everything that we do, everything that the doctors and researchers and nurses and all of the people that are involved in the process uh, do at, and the ways that think about it and obviously the ways that parents and families approach things. Um, on the one hand, you have uh, parents who feel incredibly responsible for everything that happens to their kids and really want to make the best decisions for their kids, um, mostly thinking about it from a treatment perspective, which is one of the sort of challenges in the sense that we really need to help people sort of draw focus to the, the research-specific kinds of questions, like, okay, what is different about this trial and why is it that you might think about joining the trial, not joining the trial, how do you make that decision, where, the fo where people's focus tends to be all about the treatment aspects of things. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that they are kids means that for young ones, the parents bear all of that responsibility, you know, obviously with the guidance of their doctors and other people that are working with them. But at the end of the day, parents bear that responsibility of making decisions and feel that. By the time we get to older kids, there's a different set of challenges because now you have the opportunity to involve that kid in the decisions. And so how do we do that? Sometimes parents welcome it and uh, I've been impressed at the extent to which parents say, we can't make this decision by ourselves because really this is about his life or her life and, and so we need them to be a part of that even down to kids younger than you might expect. So really engage with, a, with their kids as a family, which is great. Rarely parents say, this is not something we can involve our kid in. 
And that becomes more challenging, particularly as you get up to teenagers, where I think a lot of uh, the clinicians, the researchers feel like these are really decisions kids need to be involved in. So these are some of the challenges, I think, of working with kids, is how to engage them. Let me just add that um, as a kid has experience with chronic illness and understands the experience of being chronically ill, understands uh, with a certain degree of maturity what, what choices may, are made and what some of the implications are, kids can really be impressively mature at really young ages. And um, I, I think we realize that as clinicians and investigators, I think parents realize that. And the extent to which young kids, typically not on the first day or in the first week of their illness when they, they haven't yet had this experience, but after they've lived with it for some months or years, the extent to which they can really be mature decision makers is really quite impressive. Do you have a, a, an example you could give of that? Um, the kids who are deciding about um, participation in early phase trials uh, will often uh, clearly communicate uh, what their values are that drive their desire to do that or not to do that. Um, my colleague Pam Hines has done some uh, research involving middle school or late elementary school age children where she's asked them about their motivations for making uh, different types of decisions. And there's an impressive commitment among kids, even at those ages, to say, my involvement in this research can help other kids, and that's something that I care about. So when, when you hear that, it's a really very positive uh, thing. I think other times, without being able to draw on a specific example at the moment, um, kids feel like um, they've been through a lot of treatment. They know that the next round of treatment is not going to cure them. And they're, they're kind of done with it. And so they, they need to be able to communicate to their parents. And, and we as doctors and nurses and investigators and social workers and all that need to be able to help them do that, to communicate that message to their parents, to say, this is not for me. I need to move in a different direction. Have you developed strategies for dealing with families to help them get to this place of being able to consult with their children? So yes, although I, I wouldn't want to say that I have something that works like magic all the time. Um, I think patience more than anything else, and a clear uh, message that we, we would like to hear from your child, what he or she thinks about all of this. At the same time, I think it is really important to listen to parents and what they're saying about who their kid is as an individual. Um, the, my, the, the story I'm going to tell you is not a uh, research story. It's not a story about participation in clinical trials, but it's always, I think, uncomfortable for many of us when we're, we're talking about, when we have a patient who is middle school, certainly high school, maybe even younger, um, where it, we are not able to and their parents are not sharing with them enough about their diagnosis, their situation, for them to be able to understand what's going on, and for them to be able to feel like people are telling them sort of a fair representation of the truth. But I think back to a family with a, uh, a girl who was dying of cancer at um, 13 or so, uh, who said, this is not something we can tell her. This is not something that she would um, be able to, uh, to handle. And uh, we want to speak in vague generalities. And we insist that you not uh, tell her the specifics of her uh, situation of the fact that her cancer is not curable, um, that she will die of it. And that was a very, this, this went on for many, many months, and it's a very uncomfortable situation for me to be in personally. She's a very smart um, girl. She was very engaged and active in her life, although she did have this progressive tumor. And um, right towards the end, really within, I think, probably less than a week of the time that she actually died, um, her, she was home, and her dad sat down with her to tell her everything that he knew about what was going on her for, with her for the first time to really um, 
share that information. And um, she heard it and she was okay with that. And they were able to communicate at that time. And he was able to judge when was the right time with her. And I don't know how things would have been differently if that information had been shared with her by us, by her parents at an earlier time. Um, but I really came to respect that that was a, a set of parents that really knew their daughter and um, that I should be very humble about imposing my judgments on other people for what's right for them, what's right for their kid, what's right for their family. So I struggle with these because I do believe in uh, honesty. I certainly believe in um, answering uh, questions that kids ask. So to, to give a false answer or to fail to answer a direct question. Kids are smart. They know this. Um, so you can't do that. But how much to push, that's where I struggle. As a medical student in San Francisco, it would have probably been between my third and fourth years of medical school, I think. Uh, we had a, a one-week course in medical ethics. You stopped everything else you were doing and spent your days studying medical ethics. And the guy who ran that course uh, at UCSF was a bioethicist, well-known bioethicist named Bernie Lowe. And uh, this was my first exposure to medical ethics, and I was hooked. Um, wasn't hooked in a way that I knew um, that that was what I wanted to do as a professionally, or that that was the way my career would go. Uh, but I was fascinated, and it also I connected it to the things that I uh, saw as a medical student on the wards, taking care of patients, involved with um, doctors, involved with nurses. Uh, involved with patients. My, in my very first rotation as a medical student, I was uh, on the neurology service at San Francisco General Hospital. And uh, we had a, a woman come in one night who was um, about 90, who, had, who, who was re a recent immigrant from a country in Central America, as in, recent as in the last couple of years. But her family, her adult children, had been in the US for many, many years and were acculturated. But, she was 90 and new to the country, um, did not speak English. And she, had, uh, she came in with metastatic cancer pressing on her spinal cord, causing her legs to be paralyzed. And her family said, we understand she needs radiation, because otherwise she's going to be permanently paralyzed, and we give you permission to go ahead with the radiation. But you can't tell her that she's got cancer. And she was cognitively intact. She was not impaired. She was able to have a conversation, and, and yet her family were standing outside the room blocking anybody from going in until they swore up and down that they would not uh, share that information. And th this was an emergency in the sense that treatment needed to be started within hours. So this wasn't something that could be negotiated over days. And I, as the third year medical student, I watched this happening, and I watched the negotiation between um, the, the clinicians and the family about how to, to navigate this. And um, I was just enthralled by watching this go on, by the dilemmas, I, I, you know, sort of real concerns on both sides. Um, I watched a uh, young uh, radiation oncologist who happened to be a native of a neighboring country and a native Spanish speaker come into the uh, picture and be able to work with this family in their primary language in a very culturally competent kind of way uh, to be able to say, we at least need to find out from your mom how she wants to go forward. Does, is she somebody who wants to learn information about what's going on with their health, or does she want the information to rest with you all? Does she want you all to make the decisions? And over a period of less than an hour, I would say this conversation took place, and the family was reluctantly willing to agree to have her go in and speak with the, uh, the patient who in fact did want the information and didn't want anything held from her. And once the family saw her say, yes, I want to be a part of these discussions, then they said, okay, we get it. Um, so that was bioethics in action, right? Not by a bioethicist, but by somebody who was a skilled clinician and a skilled human communicator. And uh, so that was bioethics on the ward, and then I had Bernie and bioethics in the classroom, and a little bit of the theory, and a little bit of the how to approach a problem in a systematic and, and careful and thoughtful way. And so these little things started to put hooks in me. Um, they didn't really uh, take complete hold until I 
started working in pediatric oncology and started to find myself in these situations of, on the one hand, trying to take care of very sick kids, on the other hand, trying to offer them enrollment in studies and manage their care in the context of studies and deal with all those tensions. And so that was when it all came full circle. I got a lot of support for my desire to study these things, to try to, when I said I perceived this challenge of how to speak with families. And, and ultimately, it didn't take very long, actually, for my research to evolve from working just with kids and families to saying, well, actually, these adult, these questions, these challenges face people working with adults and face adult patients as well. So very quickly, my research became about cancer in general and not just uh, children. But I, uh, as I began to articulate these issues, the people that I work with in uh, oncology at Dana-Farber at Boston Children's at Harvard, they all got it. They all saw these challenges. They all understood that we, we could learn a lot, we could make things better, and that this was something worth pursuing, uh, which I was um, very uh, appreciative of, particularly because these are institutions where you know, the, you know, the science is in the foreground, and, and obviously the care of the patients is in the foreground. And so for somebody to be somebody young to be poking around asking these questions, it could have gone other ways. People could have said, don't do that, that's not important, or we don't really want anybody looking under these rocks. But people said, by all means, look under these rocks and let's, um, let's see what we can do. I also uh, had the good fortune of connecting with an uh, adult oncologist, not a bioethicist, but a, a medical oncologist by the name of Jane Weeks, who um, was fascinated by the questions I was asking, who was uh, a mentor like no other, uh, who had the ability to uh, teach me methods, teach me how to go about doing a research uh, project to answer a question that uh, became a 10-year, 14-year mentoring and then uh, collegial relationship. And uh, the, I can't sort of overstate the importance of mentorship in somebody who wants to develop a, a career in academics and investigation in, uh, in medicine. Uh, it's just, it's critical. Most of us, very few of us can sort of get from here to there completely on our own without some help and guidance from people who are wiser than we are. So about a year and a half ago, uh, after being at uh, Dana-Farber and Harvard for, how long was I there? 16 years. I moved to the University of Pennsylvania, uh, to the medical school there, where there is a Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy. And um, I, I moved there uh, for a number of reasons, but one uh, major reason at the time was to take on the leadership of a fellowship program that the department was starting up. Uh, Penn has a, a, a well-regarded, uh, long-standing Department of Medical Ethics and has a history of training people and was very excited under new leadership of uh, Zeke Emanuel to start a training program for people looking for academic careers or who wanted to pursue acad academic careers in bioethics. People coming out of the social sciences, people coming out of philosophy, people coming out of medicine, people coming out of law, and on and on. Um, and so when I was asked to consider the leadership of that program, it was something that I had, not, not, not pen, not that program, but the concept of leading a training program was something that I had thought about for quite a while because my experience being uh, having the kind of mentorship that I did and having the training opportunities that I did really influenced how I thought about uh, bioethics as a field. And I thought it was particularly important that there be pathways for people to get really good didactic training, really good mentor training, really good experience, really good career guidance. And that that was something that I wanted to take on because I thought the field needed it. And so it wasn't the only reason that I uh, made the choice to go to Penn, which has many other great things about it, um, but it was one of the major reasons. And so that's one of the things that I've been doing for the past year and a half since I've been there. One change, which is already well along the way, but I think has really matured, is the involvement of people who do empirical research, trying to understand how uh, sort of ethical challenges either exist in the world or are confronted in the world um, in real descriptive and empirical ways. And there's always been a very strong history of uh, theoretical, I shouldn't say always, 
go back to the 1950s, 1960s. Since then, there's been a very strong history of careful theoretical world in bioethics. Uh, most of it in the early days grew out of either theology or philosophy. But over time, it evolved to where uh, people doing clinical work, doctors, nurses, etc., were also involved in the field, sometimes doing more uh, theoretical work, saying this is the way things should be, this is the way things should not be, but sometimes doing work to actually either understand how things actually are in the world or to say how can we make things better, how can we test an intervention to try to solve this problem or that problem. So one change has been the increasing involvement of uh, people on the front lines of medicine, people on the front lines of research, people on the front lines of policy in the field of bioethics. Again, well along its, well, well on its way before I got um, into the field, but uh, has continued, I think, to grow. Uh, um, another uh, change has been, uh, I guess this is related, that uh, much research, much of that type of research requires funding. And so there have been, with, with ups and downs, uh, commitments from various funding bodies, federal government being a major one or perhaps the major one, but a number of foundations as well, to say this work is important to the public, this work is important to people's health, this work is important to us as a society. And so we're going to commit resources to making sure that uh, people, that the work is done, that there are good people out there to do it. So those are, I think, a couple of the major changes. I think the third is uh, medical schools, universities, hospitals have really developed uh, departments. Again, there were many departments there prior to my getting involved in the field. But I think over time, there has been an increasing formalization of the role of bioethics within medicine, within science, within policy, and within research. Do you think most of that is a result of outside pressure? I don't think it's um, a result of outside pressure, although I will say when there are uh, scandals, then attention is drawn, at least for a period of time, to bioethics as a place to think carefully about what's good, what's bad, think what, what should we not do, what, what should we do more of. Um, so whenever there's a scandal that breaks, one can think back to the uh, revelations in the 1990s about the radiation experiments that were done mostly on people who didn't know they were in, in, uh, subjects of experiments, uh, often on kids. Um, that was uh, a very unhappy revelation or a revelation of a very unhappy period of time. And so there was a great deal of attention drawn to uh, why did this happen? How can we prevent it from happening the next time? What lessons can we learn? Uh, the uh, much more recent story is the revelations about research in Guatemala where people uh, were intentionally infected with uh, syphilis and other diseases. And um, that was a reminder that there was a period of time in the past when uh, things were done that really shouldn't have been done. And we don't think, I, I don't think that at least in the United States today, those things are still being done, um, but there's still lessons to be drawn from them. It actually uh, connects back to the first thing we uh, talked about, my memories of living in South Africa, my consciousness of the fact that I started in South Africa, because I think one of the things that history teaches us is that when you dehumanize people or when you devalue people, then in the realm of experimentation with people, we, it, it becomes much easier to start to treat them as less than full equals, less than full moral beings. And I think these are the lessons that the history of really unethical research from uh, the earlier days of research teaches us. It's, a, it's a, a lesson of what can happen when you dehumanize and devalue people. Indeed. And what are you, so what is your agenda now as in this new, in this new position that you have where you are, will be doing training program? Well, I want um, the world to have a full complement of really highly trained, really thoughtful, uh, really experienced people who can not just answer the questions that are posed, but help to say these are the important questions that maybe haven't even been posed yet but need to be posed. So uh, my agenda in developing people is that I believe that there is 
a real need for uh, uh, empirically informed, uh, critically capable individuals who can help society as a whole, medicine, uh, public policy related to health, to think about uh, what are the things that we ought to be seeking, what are the ways in which we ought to seek them, what are the boundaries that we ought to put on how we seek them, and how can we do all of that better. So my, my major goal, at least in this role as a director of a training program, is to uh, help uh, identify and nurture people who can do all those things. Um, so that, that would be my that, that would be my principal goal in that realm. It seems that medicine is changing too in a lot of very serious ways and that some of the issues that you are interested in and concerned about are going to be ramped up to a whole different level given the new technologies in medicine. How do you think that's going to affect the field? So I, I think there's two answers to that question. Um, one has to do really with the technologies themselves and the fact that uh, the, the sophistication of, uh, of medical technology, the precision of medical knowledge that allows us to make better informed uh, choices, treatment choices for individuals based upon sort of unique features of them and to understand their diseases that much better and to, to um, treat them in ways that are more effective and hopefully safer. Um, those, are, uh, those powerful technologies are really uh, coming to the fore. And I think we're really seeing the benefits of a lot of work that's been done in laboratories and basic science departments for decades now. Think of the war on cancer for a long time. It was hard to point to the fruits of the war on cancer. And by the way, I, I um, very much dislike the phrase war on cancer, so I probably shouldn't even use it myself. I, I actually probably should avoid military metaphors uh, here. But the, but the struggle against cancer and the effort to, um, to really improve cancer treatment, I, I think it's taken a long time for the fruits to pay off, but now uh, we're seeing it. So uh, what does that mean? Well. Um, for one thing, it's all incredibly expensive, right? So, how do we uh, how do we do all of this without um, using so much of our nation's resources for treatment that there isn't enough left over to educate our kids, keep our cities running, do all of the other things that we want to do? A r real problem, right? Um, the other is. Uh, what boundaries do we put on technology? Are there some things that, um, some places we ought not to go? And if, if so, why is that? And, and how do we use our technologies widely? I am um, personally somebody who thinks a lot of the fears of the harms of technology may be overstated. Um, and that uh, I certainly don't have a knee jerk of resistance to uh, you using technology to improve health, human health. But I do think attention to uh, ways in which we need to be careful about the use of technology is uh, very important. So one set of, uh, w one part of the answer to your question about where medicine is going has to do with the technologies. But the other, I think, has to do with the organization of medicine. And uh, we are, I think, moving away from the setting of one, one doctor, one patient in an office somewhere, and into a, a setting where uh, patients have relationships with teams, where we think of medicine as a team sport, um, where uh, patients have relationships with institutions, and we really need to think about how we all work together to take care of patients, because this, this old uh, image of a doctor and a patient in an office somewhere, I think, is not completely outdated, but I think it's we're evolving away from that. And what are the implications for the field of medical ethics of all these changes? Um, what about, I think the, the big question that medical ethics faces in this realm is, what about the old models of the doctor-patient relationship can carry over to the setting of the, the relationship between a patient and a team, or the relationship between a patient and a health system? and uh, what needs to change. So for example, if a patient uh, has a relationship with a health system, the health system has a set of obligations to a whole population of patients that it's responsible for caring for. 
So how does it make sure that it does all of the advocacy for that one patient who needs something who's sick right now uh, that we have always expected from our doctors for their patients? And on the other hand, how does it meet its needs to the thousands of patients for which it's responsible? That was always true in the context of a doctor and a patient. A, doc a doctor has limited resources, even in the old model of one doctor, one patient in an office someplace. They only have so much time. They only have so much of the resources to take care of patients. They've got to spread it across people. But there was that element of that human relationship between them that we could count on to, um, to promote the advocacy. We now have systems that um, want to be able to get better in what they do and learn from what they do. And uh, they, you sometimes hear the term learning healthcare system. So imagine a big uh, hospital or a big uh, Kaiser Permanente or something like that um, that is, uh, takes care of many, many patients, has all kinds of data from the electronic medical record on those patients can use those data to learn things, if it's appropriate to use those data to learn things, both to make the care within that institution better, which you might call quality improvement, and to uh, develop insights that it can share with others around the country, around the world, for how to do things better, what works, what doesn't work. So patients' data becomes this precious resource for learning and so the question is, to what extent do we all have an obligation, given that we're all the beneficiaries of the medical care system and of the medical care that we get, to contribute our data to that effort to learn? That's one of the big systems questions. And then I think to go a step, and, and my own view is that we do, and for me to say, I want the best medical care for myself, but you don't touch my data, would be, um, I think, unreasonable. Right? Uh, I'm the beneficiary, I now have an obligation. Uh, but let's push that a little further. So now the, that healthcare system wants to tweak something and ask the question, does that actually make things better? So now we're starting to verge over into the realm of actually doing research and maybe even doing true experimentation. And um, so can we, when can a healthcare system tweak something in the way that it cares for patients? When does it require the consent of patients? When does it require that at least patients are notified of the tweaks? Um, can people opt out? Or again, are we entering an age where just by virtue of being the getting the benefits of the medical care that I get from going to see my doctors at Kaiser, I have an um, obligation to be a part of Kaiser's efforts to make care better both for its own patients and for patients everywhere. So. These are some of the big system questions that we're wrestling with right now. And there are some who want to say, uh, you, you deviate from this very uh, individual, personal uh, standard. You tweak anything and with the idea of testing to see if it makes things better. You can't do that unless you tell people about it and get their permission. And others who say, not feasible, can't do that. Uh, these are system-wide things that have to be implemented or not. And if we're going to learn something, we have to be able to think of ourselves as a community that we all move forward together, obviously with appropriate safeguards in place, appropriate governance in place, uh, appropriate engagement of patients, not um, only in the moment, in the encounter, but in the oversight and decision making about how the whole institution engages in learning. So we, we can't anymore think in terms of only relationships between two people. We have to think about how we govern whole systems. It almost becomes a question of politics. And regulations can both promote and get in the way. Could you talk a little more about that? Um, well, if we have regulations that, uh, the first question is what is, uh, uh, what's appropriate to do as a learning activity? Right? Set aside regulations for the moment. Um, what's appropriate to do without consent, what's appropriate to do with sort of full transparency, let's people know, let's let people know who may be affected by this, what's going on. But an expectation is if you're receiving your care in the system, we'll tell you what we're doing, but these are the things that um, we are doing to improve quality and to learn. And so if regulations make that possible, and um, then all is good, but if Regulations say, no, you can't 
make these modifications to the way that a system works in a particular field without getting the consent from each person that may make it impossible to actually do that thing. And so this is regulation protects people, but it may also prevent things that we all want. And that's the balance that I think we're all struggling with, including, of course, those responsible for regulations. What is one thing that you wish that all researchers would keep in mind when they interact with subjects? And we're talking on, we've been talking kind of a mega level. Yeah. We go back down to the individual level. You're, you're dealing with a person. Um, they are somebody who has um, a right to be treated as a full equal, uh, as a right to be treated as somebody who has full value in their own self. Uh, and that entails, I think, obligations of honesty, um, obligations of mutual respect, which is both um, an obligation to say to somebody, uh, here's a choice you can make, and if you don't want to be a part of this, that's your right. But I, I, I think there's a, a different sense of respect of here's somebody who is um, part of a community that benefits from these sorts of activities, so we all have responsibilities to do this, um, to treat people as mature. You know, when we're talking about little kids, we can talk about some of the differences there, but when we're talking about adults, um, the ability to engage in a mature uh, and respectful relationship and, and recognize this person is an individual and I need to treat them as somebody with uh, full value. Again, it goes back to my early experiences where I had the, the fortune or misfortune of uh, seeing people devalued, the misfortune in the moment, but in terms of the lessons that, it's carried with, that I have carried with me, um, really important for me. You just can't uh, devalue people. You just can't assume that they owe you something um, or that they are uh, somehow less of a person because they're in this vulnerable situation. I would love to see, for example, institutions that call themselves learning health systems identify all of the things that they are doing as learning activities and have them on a website someplace so that the world can see them the world can, if there's something in there that raises questions, people can ask those questions, people can criticize. Um, let's put it out there and uh, let's not be ashamed. And if we are confident that what we're doing is ethically appropriate, then there's no reason we can't tell the world what we're doing. And how do you apply this kind of theoretical framework in your own um, research practice? Um, I am, so for one thing, I would actually like to study how institutions do this and how they can do it better. Um, I continue to think a lot about informed consent and uh, how we can convey to people the essence of the choices that they have or the essence of what they ought to know in order to be aware of the activities that they're participating in. We haven't talked about my involvement in uh, genomics and genomics research, which is another aspect of my work that has um, uh, taken on much more importance to me over the last five years or so. Uh, but in that uh, realm, these are very hard uh, concepts to communicate to people and to engage in discussions about. And yet, we've got to do it if we're going to be asking people to volunteer to have their genome sequence, uh, sequenced either for purely scientific reasons or because in some way that might have some, or we might want to investigate some therapeutic benefit from that. And so the, the challenges of informed consent, both in terms of public education, patient education in a um, global sense, but also then when we're in one-on-one -on -one encounters, continue to be real challenges that uh, uh, there will always be, I think, more we can do to make that better. Can you give us an example of that from your experience? So um, with uh, genomics, there's a, a policy from the National Institutes of Health that if, if they fund sequencing of people's genomes, um, they expect that those sequence data will be placed in a uh, public in a repository that other researchers can get access to. It's not strictly speaking publicly accessible, but 
a, a repository that becomes a shared resource and that other researchers, be they elsewhere in the country or, or outside the country, can get access to. So that means that if I'm going to give a sample of my blood or my cells for sequencing, I need to have learned that, heard that, understood it, and given my agreement to that. And that is not straightforward. And it's not straightforward to understand. Uh, it's not straightforward to say. Um, it's not straightforward even to know what the right thing is to say. What do we say about uh, the chances that there will be discrimination or that there might be discrimination based upon what's in somebody's genes? My own view is that those chances are very, very, very low. But nonetheless, it's something that we have to communicate that we can't be, that there is a possibility. Um, what is the likelihood that somebody might be re-identified? It's not that their name would be attached to the sample, but unless, for, for those of us who aren't identical twins, our genomes are unique. And so, at least in theory, there's the possibility that we could be re-identified. So how do you convey these concepts that are not just complicated, but we don't even know what the truth is? They're theoretical possibilities. Um, how do you convey this in a way that somebody can make an informed decision? You don't want to falsely reassure people. You don't want to unnecessarily scare them off. You don't want to mislead them. Uh, you don't want to oversimplify. You don't want to overcomplicate. I'm certainly, I have not figured out how to do this right. Have you done such a study? Uh, we are, I've tried to write consent forms that have done this, and we've um, been, we, we are in the process of studying what people take away from those consent processes. So can't give you the answers yet, but I'm struggling with it. If you lock yourself in your office, if you don't have contact with the people who are actually wrestling with uh, the problems, then you'll never really understand what the issues are, and you won't be able to say anything that has any impact. So work with the people who um, are on the front lines. And the second thing I would say, and actually this is a theme that I should have articulated throughout many of the questions we've been talking about, is um, most of these questions are not questions only for the experts. They're questions for patients, they're questions for research subjects, they're questions for the public. And uh, we need to be partnering with the people who are affected as the, as the patients, as the research subjects, because really only they can guide us as to what's important. Uh, they can tell us how to do things better. And I think one of the great challenges for medicine and for research is developing better partnerships than we have done to date with patients, with parents, with uh, subjects, because our enterprise will be much better if it's not expert driven, but expert partnered with those who are on the, you might say, on the uh, receiving end. In the days uh, while I was in Boston, we were, we, we at Dana-Farber and Brigham and Women's and Boston Children's, the, the, those hospitals, were on the forefront of developing a drug for the treatment of a particular complication, particular life-threatening complication of bone marrow transplant called veno-occlusive disease. And which is a disease or a complication where the chemotherapy, the radiation from the transplant really damages the liver. And uh, in the past, there was the only treatments for this were to support fluids and blood pressure and breathing and sort of hope and pray that patients would get better on their own and too often they didn't. Well, this treatment name called defibrotide came along. Still not uh, approved in the United States for this um, condition. It's still an investigational agent. But based upon the early data, based on, upon a lot of enthusiasm by the people who knew the most about it, uh, there was, we were all pretty convinced that it really could make a difference to people with this condition who were, you know, in my experience, kids with a life-threatening disease, terrified parents. And um, one of the struggles of convey of, of having a conversation with families and, and there are a number of families where I struggle with this was how to convey the two messages that seem like they're opposite. One is this is an experimental drug. One of the reasons we're doing or the reason we're doing this research is because we're trying to find out if it works, if it's safe. And on the other hand, 
we think this may be the difference, it just might be the difference between life and death for your child. And those are not two, me those two messages are not consistent with each other. Um, and I never figured out how to do it well. I think the, the hopeful message, which I think in retrospect has been borne out, um, was the, probably the one that I conveyed, that this is really uh, the right therapy for your child now, even though it's investigational. We, we're not talking about placebo-controlled trials or anything like that. So it was, these were studies where if you join, you got the drug. Um, and where that has the, the evolution of that, I, I talked a little bit about the, the basic science of cancer therapy evolving to the point where we've really gotten much better at what we do. And, and at least for many cancers, there are much better drugs either available or on the horizons. Is that there's a lot of enthusiasm about things working and a lot of a desire to assume that things will work and to engage in conversations with families and with patients to say, this is the best option for your child. So now that I'm in Philadelphia, where they've been very involved with the development of um, a kind of immune therapy called T cell therapy, um, there's a strong belief, I think grounded in good reason, to think that this is really um, very hopeful therapy. And we want to be able to say that to patients and families. And on the other hand, we want to be able to say, this is as yet not fully proven. And you need to understand that you are joining an experiment, not scare anybody away, and yet present that fair picture. And yet those are two contradictory messages. It's very hard to convey those contradictory messages. And that doesn't change. That doesn't change. And as, um, as the science underlying new interventions gets better, the old models of we really don't know what we're doing, so we're just kind of testing things, and maybe they'll work and maybe they won't, and that kind of way of framing an experiment, I think we're evolving away from that to there's a pretty good hypothesis here. There's pretty good... Um, science, the people in the lab who developed this, who got it to this point, are pretty smart. They have a pretty good understanding of what's going on. Um, this may not work, and we still know that many things that are exciting early on turn out not to work for one reason or another. But uh, I think the odds are probably getting better, at least in my field. And so we, we don't want to be um, excessively skeptical in the way that we present things. And on the other hand, we don't want to be overly optimistic or to misrepresent things in any way. I'm happy to see science getting better so that therapy is getting better quickly. It's been, for me, being a, a young to now middle-aged uh, oncologist in, um, in an age where we've gone from sort of shotgun therapy or uh, you know, not very carefully um, targeted therapy to really pretty uh, targeted, scientifically driven therapy. It's pretty wonderful to watch that transformation. I talked in the last few minutes about how uh, science is getting better, and so the sort of strength of the theory that leads us to do a particular experiment or to test a particular intervention is just getting that much better. At the same time, I think there's a danger that we may lose sight of the fact that we still need to do the experiments, we still need to prove that things work. Um, the, the excitement of the laboratory, the brilliance of the laboratory can't uh, cause us to lose sight of the fact that we still need to demonstrate in people that things work, that they're effective, that they're better than the alternatives, that they're safe. And I see a, a real motivation to shortcut that process of human experimentation a little bit, um, partly because we're so enthusiastic about what we've been able to learn in the laboratory, partly because the public totally understandably wants things developed faster, and any sign that uh, new 
new drugs, new interventions, new devices for uh, bad diseases are being held back so that they can be studied more carefully, so that the level of evidence that can be brought to bear is more robust. Uh, there's, it's not a popular point of view that things should be held back until they are carefully vetted. We want them out there now. I totally get it. On the other hand, I, I worry that we're going to find ourselves in a situation where lots of stuff gets out into practice, lots of stuff gets approved that may actually not be effective or more effective than the alternatives or safe. Um, and I've always been somebody who's actually quite cautious about believing that things need to be carefully evaluated before they're made available for wide use, even if that means slowing things down a little bit. I'm all for designing studies that allow us to ask and answer questions more quickly, but I want high quality evidence. And uh, I think that patients deserve treatments, recommendations from their doctors based upon high quality evidence. And I worry a lot that the enthusiasm for these uh, new scientifically driven compounds is going to shortcut that and we're going to lose sight of that evidence. Do you see any ways to reverse that trend? Um, it's a very hard wave to stop or to slow down. What may happen? Pendulum swing, right? And if uh, there's a drug that is approved and turns out to be uh, ineffective and dangerous and you look back and do the sort of uh, the after action review you might say and say well why did this happen well because it was approved too quickly because we didn't do the careful science then that may cause the pendulum to swing back a little bit in the other direction but uh, for, for patients families who are dealing with terrible illnesses and for whom medicine doesn't have a lot to offer in the, the standard uh, repertoire it's, uh, we will, we will, all of us, and I suspect myself included, if I were in that situation, would say, well, what else is out there that I could do for myself and my loved one? And that's a very hard, uh, hard thing to stop.